have my special guest here tonight. Uh, my guest here tonight is Bill Salas. So come on in, Bill. Thank you for joining me. This is going to be, oh, all right. Why don't you do the elbow? <laughs> we are socially distant right here, uh, right now. It's going to be exciting here. Uh, Bill, thank you. We've themed this night uh, the, say, goodbye, birth pangs, hello, tribulation. But what we're going to do is, is I've asked you to be here to help answer some questions because people have a lot of questions. A lot of people want to know. Uh, they think that the tribulation is next week. Um, we don't know. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen. Uh, some people think that the mark of the beast is going to be here within the next three weeks because everything they're hearing about Bill Gates. But what I want to do is make sense of everything. And also, we have the Bible to be able to control fears and to be able to have faith in the Lord and to be able to make sense uh, of things. Bill, I've been teaching Bible prophecy, as I mentioned, over 25 years. You've been teaching Bible prophecy for a long time. Um, and we have God's word to guide us. So you ready? I'm ready, Tom. Anything you want to say to everybody before we get started? Well, uh, hello. It's good to be with you all again. Um, what Tom just said was a lot of really important prophetic events, the big major bullet points of about a dozen things. There's literally about a hundred unfulfilled prophecies yet to find fulfillment, probably soon and sequentially in the very near future. And this coronavirus right now, I believe, is starting to put everything into turbo mode right now. Uh, the, the cash to society seems to be on the horizon, et cetera. So uh, looking forward to kind of putting this thing and parsing it in the right sequences and in the right time frames in this, this conversation. This is going to be great. So well, I, as I look at things, we have, I want to talk about the birth pangs. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, right? So let's get going with them. How many birth pangs are there that we can look at? And let's identify them and then put them into the proper category for the time frame in which we are right now. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, if you look at COVID-19, everybody's kind of wondering, well, are, is that something that Bible prophecy predicted? Where is it going, et cetera? Um, technically, you won't find COVID-19 or coronavirus anywhere in the scriptures per se, but it is a pestilence, a pandemic per se. And pandemics are part of the beginning of sorrows period in Matthew 24, verses 7 through 8. Talks, there's actually six distinct periods that Christ put forward in Matthew 24. I'm kind of going to jump right to the third period, which is the beginning of sorrows, also called the birth pangs. And in that period of time, which I believe started in 1914, I think we can actually chart these distinct periods of time, uh, he said nation would come against nation, kingdom would come against kingdom, there would be... Uh, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. So we have those are the general birth pangs to watch for. Now these are going to be, of course, significant events because it, it's just the, the beginning of sorrows. There are other events in the uh, period called the time has not yet ended prior to this that were also very powerful. But as we start going down the cal prophetic calendar toward the end, everything gets much bigger. So uh, I personally believe we've been in the beginning of sorrows period, which where the pestilences are right now with the COVID-19. Uh, for over a century, right? So 1914 now. takes us back to World War One, right? Okay, and I know a lot of Bible prophecy teachers have taught that. I think Tim LaHaye w was one that also taught that. So over a hundred years in this time frame, um, but uh, so but we're looking at it, and it's goodbye birth pains. We're about out of them, and I, I look at what's happening right now as being. Uh, we are witnessing the birth of the New World Order because the Bible also talks about mm -hmm. a New World Order, a global government that's going to come uh, with 10 leaders of that government. So I think these things are forming right now. But with these, so let's start off with the birth, the first, the, the first one, mm -hmm. beginning of sorrow, a.k.a. birth things. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's the first one? Well, uh, nation comes against nation. So let me kind of give a little preface to get to that because it deserves this little bit of information because we're going to try to put some time slots onto this, this, what Jesus told his disciples. Jesus was w walking outside the temple after he just in Matthew 23 gave a scathing review of the scribes and Pharisees. Eight times he said, woe to you. Seven times he called them hypocrites. Two times he called them blind leaders in Matthew 23. They were lawless, extortionists, murderers, servants, broods of vipers. And he's walking out of the temple now after that scathing review. And his disciples say to him in Matthew 24, verse 1, they're marveling at the temple, talking trivially about this. And he's, Jesus is in no mood for that. So Jesus says, well, listen, I tell you, every one of those stones is going to come down one upon another. All of a sudden, the disciples got real serious real quick. They had a powwow, whatever they talked about. 
And several things must have come to their mind at that time. One was, well, first of all, he doesn't want us to be talking about flippant things. He's just come out of yeah. skating review. Two, uh, when the stone comes down upon stone, he's talking about the destruction of the temple. The last time the stone came down upon stone, our people went into 70 years of captivity. Is, he, is Jesus starting to allude to the fact we're going into the worldwide dispersion soon when these stones come down and this temple is destroyed, which he was. Of course, the prophets Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and others had talked about a worldwide dispersion. And so they get serious and they ask the, the question to Jesus and they come back and it was the right question. And they say, well, when will, this, when will these things be, meaning the destruction of the temple? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus comes in and he starts talking about in Matthew 24, responding to that. He says, the temple is going to come down stone upon stone. That happened in 70 AD. So that was the first period he talked about the destruction of the temple. The second period he talked about is called the end is not yet. And that takes us, we start saying now, don't be deceived. Many are going to come in my name, saying they're the Christ. Don't be deceived. He says there'll be uh, wars and rumors of war. And he said, but don't be troubled. The end is not yet. So they've asked, when will the end be? He said, the end is not yet. These certain things are going to happen. And so what happened, now the Jews are out in the nations of the world. Now remember this as we talk about these, these time periods. Uh, and basically the wars and rumors of wars, yes, there were wars going on. Uh, nations, meaning internal strife. There were the Crusades. There was a uh, nation would fight against another nation, but they weren't nations against nations per se. So that was going on for 1844 years from 70 AD to 1914. So 1844 years, and all of a sudden now we get into the nation comes against nation, World War I. And that's where you had the, that period of time now that the land of Israel was going to be prepared for the Jews. Mm -hmm. World War I happens. At the same time World War I is happening in 1914 to 1918, the Spanish flu hits. Now we've got a pandemic of pestilence. Mm -hmm. Remember it says there'll be famines, pestilences, and mm -hmm. earthquakes. So that hit at the same time. That happened in 1918 while World War I was starting to wind down. And that infected up to 500 million people, maybe killed up to 50 million people. That was huge. But it didn't shut down the whole world necessarily like yeah. it did like it's doing right now. Sure. So that was when that began. And then, the, and then we've got to talk about, well, how did that prepare the land for the people? And the World War II okay. prepared the people for the land. Okay. Well, let me ask you about that. So 1914, you have nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So was World War I kingdom against kingdom? No, the way, okay. I would, the way I would look at that okay. kingdom against kingdom is out of, defined out of Isaiah 19, where it says the Lord flies, flies into Egypt on swift cloud, brother comes against brother, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. It goes from civil strife and blossoms into a regional conflict. Okay. That's a regional conflict, which happened after the Jews come back in the land. After the Second okay. World War II, they come back in the land. The Arab kingdom comes against the Jewish kingdom, 1948, 67, 73, still not resolved. The Arab kingdom came against the Persian kingdom, 1980 to 1988, uh, with the Iraq-Iran war. You had, um, you're probably going to have the Persian-Jewish kingdom coming together in Jeremiah chapter 49, the Elam prophecy, and other kingdom again, yeah. kingdom conflicts, South Korea, North Korea, Vietnam. Those things were going on, but I'm focusing primarily okay. on the Middle East. Okay, so we have World War I, 1914, 1918 Spanish flu, also coming out of World War I, the Balfour Declaration of 1917. And then following the Balfour Declaration, we have the San Remo Conference, which just celebrated its 100th anniversary just last week. Mm -hmm. Now, this, uh, what uh, a lot of people don't know, Balfour Declaration, in which I have a copy of it somewhere, um, uh, and the San Remo Conference both had to do with the Jews being able to gather back in the land of Israel. And so all of these things that we're talking about tonight, they don't have a placeholder unless the Jews are back in the land. Mm -hmm. But those things all started happening at the same time, including the modern Zionist movement started in the late 1800s. So that all developed World War I, and then we enter here, San Remo Conference. Uh, real briefly, can you update our uh, viewers on what the San Remo Conference did? Right, what the beginning of Sorrows also did was it paved the way for the return of the Jews into the land, which was also prophesied heavily by the Hebrew prophets, return of the Jews back into the nation of Israel, which happened on May 14th, 1948, in the period of the beginning of Sorrows of the Birth Pain. So what happened in 1917, Lord Balfour put together the Balfour Declaration, which talked about, it was a pro pro public proclamation from England, who the son never used to set on the British Empire at that time, saying that the Jews have a right to their land. Now in 19, and less than three years later, in April of 1920, they met in Italy, San Remo, Italy, and you had the UK, France, Japan, Italy, and America was there as, as an observer. 
and they ratified the Balfour Declaration, which technically, because of the powers that were invested in them as the victors at that point of World War I, made that a legal binding document, the, the uh, San Remo Resolution. So they've celebrated, like you said, for 100 years now. So now the land is prepared for the Jews, but the, they never acted on the Balfour Declaration. The UK should have. At that time, the sun never used to set on it. They had control over 458 million people throughout the world. That was about a fourth of the world's population or a fifth of the world's population. They had 13 million square feet of, of square miles they were sovereign over, about a, fi a fourth of the world's land mass. And they didn't do what they did. Now look at them. They've got 94,000 square miles in the UK and 66.5 million people that they're sovereign over. Now, America, of course, was rising during the beginning of sorrows when the UK was declining. And now here so, we are. Can I ask you a question? So would you say then, uh, I, I look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where God's speaking to Abraham with his covenant, I will bless those who bless thee, I'll curse those who curse thee. Uh, we have, the UK has shrunk its influence, and the United States, in the meantime, blessed Israel and has obviously become uh, the, the power that it is today, which... You know, you know, I look that we can talk about the United States in a few more minutes if we have time. But is that what you see has happened? Well, because you're a good point. And I think that we all need to understand, in the Christian and the prophetic community, God's foreign policy established 4,000 years ago in general, Genesis to the Gentiles, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, is still effectually intact. He said, I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. And that extrapolated on through Abraham, to Isaac, his son, Jacob, his grandson on through the 12 sons of Jacob, uh, Jacob, who was later called Israel. It's representing what, how we treat Israel today, mm -hmm. corporately speaking. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to answer a question I know a lot of people have before, I, before we go to the next thing. But this is regarding the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. And Bill, you probably get it. I get it a lot. I know a lot of your friends, do, we, we travel in some of the same circles, that uh, why do we care so much about the Jewish people? For one thing, God has given us a heart for them and for the nation of Israel, because God has covenant with, mm -hmm. uh, with the Jewish people. We recognize that the New Testament is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. Jesus is a Jewish Messiah. But this is what I, I'm going to ask everybody to keep in mind. Just think of this. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 23 to the Jewish leaders, just before you get to chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, and then just before Jesus enters into his uh, last few days before he's crucified. He says this in Matthew chapter 23. Uh, when the people, after the people have shouted Hosanna, he says to the Jewish leaders, you will not see me again until you say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I was talking with my friend Olivier Melnick, who's vice president of Chosen People Ministries, and he said, the, the Jewish people need to know about Christ, because Jesus says, I am not returning until the Jews are saying as a whole, mm -hmm. um, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, recognizing Yeshua as Savior. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I look at that, and this is what the Lord would have me do. This is, these are the people he has covenant with. And I think a lot of people, they're into prophecy. They don't understand what the deal is with Israel. Everything is contingent upon the Jewish people and upon Israel. Now, that probably just got some people bothered. So here's what else you can do. Send in your question. You can send them live chat right now. Listen, we're going to get them. They're going to be forwarded to me. I will answer with Bill any questions that we have. Um, and also, I want to encourage you to make sure that you, if you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel yet, uh, please subscribe to it. It's absolutely free. And, um, and also share this. You can even share this right now if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're watching this on my Facebook uh, uh, page. You can also share it from there. But go for it and make sure that you subscribe and share it. But Bill, I want to get, keep going because we have a whole lot to talk about here, and we're going to answer a lot of questions before our time is done here. So we've only looked at uh, the, the first part of the beginning of sorrows, the very beginning. So after this, we have nation against nation. What, what's coming next? All right, so these six periods of time that Christ laid out in Matthew 24 were very distinctive. They're, they're not nebulous. They're not going to be vague. We're supposed to know when they came. The temple came down. That was obvious. Stone came down upon stone. Nation came against nation. We know that concluded the end is not yet period. Started the beginning of sorrows period. And we find out that those famines and pestilences and earthquakes, they've been increasing throughout this last century. We, we had SARS, you had MERS, etc. cetera. Um, the thing is, when, I think we have to realize that when we talk about the significance of 
famines and pestilence, they're, they're the big ones that really hit us, and they've been hitting us, and probably going to continue to hit us from this point forward as we conclude with the bidding of sorrows. So, for instance, uh, the significance of the enormity of, you have a huge uh, famine, you say, father can't feed his son. That's a significant event. Uh, uh, pestilence that we have right now, a father can't hold his son. Right. Yeah, people can't even, go, I, I, you've probably heard of people, we, we are people because of church, that they've had a baby and they're, they're not allowed to go to the hospital. That's right. Dad can't go to the hospital to hold his newborn baby. You mm -hmm. go, this, but this, anyway, keep going. Well, and, and earthquakes, I can't find my son, right? So th these are significant yeah. events that will be characterized by that type of situation going on with a familial scenario. You're right about that thing. Naftali Bennett, the uh, defense minister yeah. of Israel, encouraged grandchildren not to even see their grandparents in Israel. Yeah. We've had that even been encouraged in America as well. So a father can't hold his son. Well, this is the kind of pandemic we're dealing with right now. Yeah. So what happens now is we're, we're asking ourselves, because you know, most of us prophecy guys now are having to become experts on the new coming one world order, the mark of the beast. How's that going to manifest itself through digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technologies, and stuff like that? So we're all having to really quickly understand this stuff because cash is dying on the vine right now. It's mm -hmm. in, when, when, this crypto, when this virus hit, China went out and cleaned a whole bunch of their money because it was dirty, it was get, can contain viruses, et cetera. So we're seeing right now all this stuff is accelerating. So the question is, what we're really talking about, and you, you talked about a lot of these items in the beginning of the program, we're talking about getting into the tribulation period, which is the fourth period okay. Christ talked about in Matthew 24, verse 9. He said, after the beginning of service, then they will deliver you up into tribulation and you'll be persecuted for my name's sake. That's that seven-year tribulation period. So we have to ask ourselves, if COVID-19 and coronavirus is indicating we're at the nearing the end of a century now, it's been over 100 years since World War I, at the beginning of sorrows, are we just about to be plunged in to that perilous period called the seven-year tribulation period? And that's, that's the $50 million question right yeah. now. And my answer is likely yes. Well, here's, here's two, I actually just got a bunch of questions in. Um, uh, one of them has to do with the Battle of Armageddon. Does it happen before or after the rapture? We'll get to that later, right? I know we both think alike on that. Here's this. this yes, you just answered this. My question is, how far from the tribulation do you think we are? I know that no one knows the time or the hour, but any idea of how many more years, you know? Um, and, but you answer it. We are close. I mean, how you look at these things. So Jesus didn't, he, he tells us we don't know the day or the hour. But like you, you're talking about Matthew chapter 24. He did tell us what to watch for. Mm -hmm. So we are watching. And I want to, you to develop this for our, everybody that's watching. You're supposed to, we're all supposed to be experts. Listen, I'm not a, a money expert. Um, I'm smart enough to figure out some things. Um, I'm not a cryptocurrency expert. You understand it better than I do. I'm going to ask you some questions on cryptocurrency because mm -hmm. there's some things that need to be developed for mm -hmm. this global system to come in place. Mm -hmm. There's some things that need to be developed for the mark of the beast to come in place. There's a lot of prophecy people out there right now. They're saying uh, this Bill Gates vaccine uh, thing is the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. um, but things have to be developed. Am I correct? Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to get there. Let me put it into another perspective. Uh, this was Damon Duck. I think you know who he is. Yes. Prophecy sure. writer. In less than three months, the global economy has almost been destroyed. Several oil companies are facing bankruptcy, not to mention airline industry is just devastated. Millions of jobs have been lost. The U.S. Constitution has been trampled upon. Several institutions, churches, schools, colleges, have been disrupted. Um, Christians are told uh, not to go to church. People are told don't shake hands, uh, don't hug. Uh, more than 200,000 people have died. I think that's globally. I'm not sure on the exact number. Thousands of families don't get to say goodbye. Uh, with a funeral, people are still passing away. Um, supply chains have been disrupted. Uh, there have been some cases of panic buying, as, as we've seen. Many businesses have closed, some permanently. Drones from China are watching people in Connecticut to see if they are social distancing, coughing, or sneezing. Uh, Pope Francis is pushing a one-world government, a world religion, wealth redistribution, and more. And many, he says this, and then, then we're going to move on to the question that I have for you. Many believe Bible prophecy is being fulfilled all around us, and we are uh, getting just a tiny glimpse of what the tribulation period will be like. But ultimately, he concludes the most important thing 
is these show us the urgency for the need of the gospel of Jesus Christ to get out there. So with this perspective, we always got to keep that in the right frame. When we understand Bible prophecy, it should inspire an urgency with believers to say, we need to tell people Jesus came the first time. He's coming again. We got the sign. He's coming again. And, and I'm going to let you do that <laughs> as I start to freak everybody yeah. out with what's really happening on the time frame. Okay. Because you're absolutely right. One question was, are we going to be raptured before Armageddon? Okay. Well, you and I are both pre-trib yeah. believers. We believe we will be raptured before the tribulation. And the Armageddon is the campaign at the end of the seven-year tribulation yeah. period when Jesus comes and takes out the Antichrist and his Armageddonites. But so, do I believe we're actually about to transition from the beginning of sorrows or otherwise birth pangs in some translations into the tribulation period? I think that's probably very close because several reasons I say that. Nation has come against nation. Kingdom has come against kingdom. There's been famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. We're living in one right now, the big pandemics. Um, all the other end time signs are converging, like we've talked about right now. There's no weapon that hasn't been fashioned. No technology has not been developed. No national relationship that's not in the formative or been formed relationships right now. Um, and also, we look at this where it's going into the tribulation period where there's going to be a one world order and a cashless economy, most of would say is going to happen. We're seeing that the technologies for that are racing together really quickly when we get into the cryptocurrencies and things like that. So I would say we're likely to be getting really close to that. However, if that means the tribulation is on point B, not too far down the road on the end times line, what happens between now and that point in time? Because there are yeah. pre-tribulation prophecy <clears throat> that could happen yeah. at the present time. The rapture, of course, is at the top of that and list. It have, rapture could happen at any moment. That's what we all need to be aware of regardless of when the tribulation starts with the, the covenant of Daniel chapter 9, you and I, I think, would both agree that's what begins the 70th week of Daniel or the seven-year tribulation period. And the rapture could happen tonight. Uh, we don't know, which would really fast-forward everything. Uh, just think of how fast-forward everything became just since coronavirus. Okay, so this is an article both you and I read by Britt Gillette. I enjoy his articles. And uh, this is going to help you put things together for everybody that's watching to help them understand how things need to be developed. So Britt uh, Gillette has this. He says, how the coronavirus sets the stage for the end times. And then he says, number one, it calls, there are calls now for a strong European leader. And so comment on that, strong European leader. Right. Well, the, we've, we understand who that European leader is that he's probably insinuating, and that is the Antichrist, because yeah. we're told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, he comes out of the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. So this prince that is to come, the Antichrist, the city was Jerusalem. The sanctuary was the Jewish temple, was raised to the ground. 70 A.D., part, part one of the yeah. Olivet Discourse of those six periods, 70 A.D., he's coming out of the revived Roman Empire. So that's why that's an important point he's making. Yeah, it's, so, and it's a huge deal, which also takes us to the second point he brings up. It calls for further European Union integration. So right. you, have, you gotta have this European leader, according to the Bible, the way things are going to unfold, mm -hmm. European Union integration. Right, because this virus is causing all kinds of problems. If they could have acted in concert uh, with a, more, a better leader in place, they could have avoided a lot of the c contamination of the cases and the deaths and things like that. Yeah. That's what he points out in the, the article. He does. In fact, this is what he says. The coronavirus has devastated Italy, the fourth largest economy in the EU, and the eighth largest in the world. The Italian economy, and I think this is really good for people to wrap their minds around, the Italian economy effectively has been closed since March 9th. Unlike the United States, which can print money for business bailouts, and stimulus checks, Italy doesn't have control over its mm -hmm. own currency. Like other EU countries, Italy uses the euro, and that means their national debt is denominated in euros. The only way Italy can pay its debts is to collect taxes. If the economy tanks, so does tax collection. This means Italy will soon be at the epicenter of a massive debt crisis. And then he brings up uh, the example of Greece. Mm -hmm. And you know what happened with Greece? We were in Greece probably almost two years ago. And you can see how devastated Greece mm -hmm. still is to this day. He's saying, look, if you look at it, this is the direction things are going. Mm -hmm. And I think out of the ashes of what's happening in Europe, or what it looks like is going to happen in Europe, mm -hmm. 
in Italy, there is going to be this leader that's going to rise, but they do, he makes the point, they need to form this cohesive union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the thing with the EU coming together, it's going to come together out of necessity. They, they, they're trying to make it a United States of Europe because the United States model has worked, but they have problems with that, and that's been exemplified ever since they've tried to become a union together, different languages, different cultures. They've warred against each other. There's different economic scales of, of economies there. So out of necessity, they're going to come together. Is this the potential time, this type of necessity? It, if not, it's certainly a good dress rehearsal. Yeah, definitely a dress rehearsal. It looks to me, Bill, like what's happening is everything is being shaped for what is soon coming. Everything has to be formed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Agenda 2030. Uh, you're familiar with it. I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, in Agenda 2030, it is the intent to bring about this global system with a leader at the top of it, mm -hmm. a one world religion, climate laws all enforced, everybody living in harmony, everybody being tracked, everybody being monitored, buying and selling is monitored. Everything you read about in the Bible mm -hmm. is part of the Agenda 2030. And so that, the, attempt, the intent is to get to this government within the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So if that's the goal, it appears that things are being shaped for that. Right, and you know, what he's saying is a good point. Uh, there are articles and stuff, I'm putting, putting headlines and stuff in my new book dealing with this very topic, the second half of the, the tribulation period, the Great Tribulation. There, uh, Deutsche Bank came out with an article saying that they believe that the a massive adoption throughout the world of cryptocurrencies will happen, digital dollars, digital currencies, by 2030, 10 years from now. Now, because of the coronavirus, they came out with another statement, Digi uh, Deutsche Bank came out to Reuters and said, now this, we're concerned we might have a digital dollar in place in their area, in their bank, in three years. Okay, this takes me to this question. This is perfect. So I want you to answer this based on the cryptocurrency, what you see developing. Uh, this person quotes Revelation chapter 22, Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me, to give every man according, to, uh, according as his work shall be. Then he says, to ask Bill, my guest, uh, about the speed at which things are taking place. And that's really what you just said, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like everything has now been shifted into overdrive. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the analogy, and you've, I've heard you use it before too with birth pains, being in sorrows. When a woman is about to give birth, alluding to the second coming of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the baby is about to come out, her intent, uh, contractions become more intense, they become more frequent, and you can't stop them, the baby's going to come out. So when you see world events started to get more intense, with more intensity and more frequency, uh, then you're going to say, you know, that this, these are the birth pangs he spoke about. But the birth pangs are just one distinct period. Then it says, we'll give you up, they'll give you up to tribulation, which is where that all goes into that seven year period. Now, I personally believe there's a rapture. There's a slight period of time of a gap because it's not the rapture that prompts Israel to be part of that Daniel 9, 27 covenant. So I call it a post rapture, pre tribulation gap period. Uh, many people b agree with that Hitchcock, Reagan, Stearman, et cetera. Uh, some people don't, but I, I can, I'll be glad to have a debate with them, why not? But the point is, is that that may only be weeks, months, or a few years, but it won't yeah. necessarily be a long time. Right. So I, I think more and more people are, be, are believing that. Uh, Tim LaHaye used to teach that. The rapture will take place. There will be a time, some time that goes by before the covenant is confirmed in Daniel chapter 9, which begins the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. so you say it could be weeks or months. Some people have even said it could be three years, could even be longer. I'm inclined more toward two or three years. Yeah, okay, yeah. so it's going to take time to get things in order. Um, uh, but you can imagine right now, if a rapture took place tonight when so many people are sheltering at home, it wouldn't be as much of a disruption to the economy. People would be missing, nobody would even know people are missing, and airplanes wouldn't be falling out of the sky like they were in, in the Left Behind uh, series. Good point, but let me say this. If there is a gap after the rapture, it's uh -huh. going to be intense because it's still part of the beginning of sorrows period. The beginning of sorrows ends when the, then they'll cast you into tribulation, according to Matthew on verse 24, chapter 24, verse 9. So what you see in Luke chapter 21, man, I'm getting a lot of questions. <laughs> My phone won't quit. So in Luke chapter 21, <clears throat> where Jesus talks about, he says uh, um, there will be uh, um, uh, signs in the sun, the moon, the sky, uh, seeing the waves will be roaring, men's hearts will fail them from the fear and expectation of things coming upon the planet. He says, then he says, uh, when you see these things begin to take place, look up for your redemption draws near. Where would you put in 
that begin to take place? Is that where we are right now? We're watching the beginning of these things? Well, um, I would say that's probably what we should be watching for because if our redemption draws near, he was probably alluding to the church. Um, if he was yes. alluding, if he's alluding to the I, remnant I of agree. the Jews, then he right. that would not be applied to be more of the truth. I, I would agree with that. And in fact, um, this, maybe this will help our viewers to understand. Matthew and Luke both include the Olivet Discourse. Um, Matthew is Jewish, and he's taking the perspective of conveying the message to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Luke was a Gentile. And when he's writing, you can clearly see the things from the Olivet Discourse that Luke spoke of, um, although there's a lot of similarities, you get to parts of it, and it appears Luke is writing to Gentile believers in Christ. So you have a little bit different uh, uh, um, uh, application. Mm -hmm. Hence, look up for your redemption draws near. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, let me get back to this. So along with how the coronavirus sets the stage for the end times, uh, he also states this. It calls for increased tracking of people. Now, let, let me read this to you and comment on this, because this is fascinating, what he said. With shutdowns all over the world bringing the global economy to a standstill, calls are getting louder to reopen the economy and to get people back to work. But how do you get people back to work without causing a spike in new coronavirus cases? Some people are pushing a solution that involves increased tracking of people. They believe the government should track everyone's mobile phone. When someone gets the coronavirus, the government can easily retrace their steps and find everyone who came within a few feet of the infected person. Then they'll place those people in a mandatory quarantine. Some nations, such as South Korea, already do this. Other people favor giving papers to those who have recovered from coronavirus. These official papers will allow you to travel in public or go back to work. Then he says this profound statement. Some warn this is the road to author authoritarianism, but it isn't. He writes, once we do this, we're, we've already arrived. Mm -hmm. And this is the direction that we can see everything is rapidly going, just like that question, how fast is this happening? It's coming fast. Right, well, and it, let's take it to where this is, where the tracking becomes an issue. Um, the Antichrist and the midpoint of the tribulation, the, cash, the, mark of, the mark of the beast is going to come out, and that generates a, no one will buy or sell unless they have this mark. People would say that's a cashless society. Now, that's all it technically says. Let's remember that. But we can derive certain things from that. In other words, false prophets on the scene, uh, he they makes this image of the beast. People have to worship it. If they don't worship it, they will be killed. Mm -hmm. But then he says he causes all, meaning everyone on the planet that's alive at that time, to receive the mark of the beast either upon their right hand or on their forehead. Okay, so and, and that no one may buy or sell unless they have that. That's all it really says. It doesn't say he's going to track everybody. Um, and the other things that we lead off into is going to be a digital economy and a cashless society. We then presume it's going to be a cashless society because how can he monitor whoever, whoever's buying and selling unless he's using the technologies available today, unless he's using the digital scenarios available to him. So that's the thing. We kind of backtrack from there. And why does he want mm -hmm. to have control over all that sort of thing? Well, there's multiple reasons, but you know, one thing he wants to do is he wants to be able to track people. He wants to know their, their, their habits, their spending habits, their, their whole behavior, their allegiance to him, etc. And by the way, taking the mark of the beast is like a loyalty badge. It's, it's a rewards-based thing for worshiping him. It's, it's, you know, in other words, you don't, it's not someone who just accidentally gets some technology on their, forehead, their hand or their forehead. Right. It's almost, did I just take the mark of the beast? No, it's, right. you will worship him, and you, as a result of that, you get this, right. this reward. I think a great way of putting it, uh, my friend Tom T uh, Gilbert said, we are not going to be tricked into receiving the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. He said, right now, is, the talk is medical to receive tracking. Then it's going to be a moral decision to worship Antichrist. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be tricked being told it's medical. Oh, wait, you just received right. the mark of the beast. Right, yeah. and, I, and so um, there's been credit cards, debit cards, Social Security cards, all types of different things that people have said, this is the mark of the beast. So currently, there's some prophecy teachers that are looking at what's happening, and they're saying, this is it. And, you know, it could be the foundation for what we are watching with um, this, this ID 2020 that's coming. Mm -hmm. 
do you think it could be the foundation of that? Well, I think it's a, a good point you're making. Back in the 50s when the credit card came out, so did, so did the barcodes, right? And then the debit cards came out around the 70s. And everybody was thinking, okay, we've arrived. The technologies are in place now for the mark of the beast to come and the cashless economy to happen. Okay, well, no one's really talking about those things now because now they're being overridden by the cryptocurrencies and the blockchain, digital dollar, and this sort of thing. That's where this is going, and that technology is advancing rapidly. You've got, this started back in 2009, or at the end of 2008, after the economic crisis, the Bitcoin came out, sold for pennies at that time. In 2017, it's a, it's a cryptocurrency, one of the first ones developed. It exploded and was selling for $19,000 per Bitcoin. It's at 9000 right now. But since that time, in 2017, uh, Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook has come out, and he wants to implement the Libra cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Uh, Microsoft's in the hunt now. There's already f over 5,000 cryptocurrencies listed that you can get. It's a $548 billion uh, industry right now. And you've got other people racing to it. Sweden's already, and China are already implementing it on pilot programs. Sweden's already done implants on it using this cryptocurrency, this blockchain technology. And I, I'll explain in a moment what, the, what the cryptocurrency is and blockchain is for the viewers. But you also have in this hunt right now, it's like a it's a race to the moon again, but it's a race for the, the better Bitcoin. You've got America's involved, France, UK, Israel, China, India, Sweden. I mean, the list goes on. There's almost about 30 countries already, and they're growing by the minute of people interested in this, this type of currency. But it's got to be developed. It's got to be sold. And when it's all put together, it's all going got to be submitted to the Antichrist because ultimately he's going to want to control it all. You can't have independent currencies going yeah. on that he can't control. You can't have 500 different cryptocurrencies that are out there and have the system work. Ultimately, it appears to me, whoever controls the currency is going to be able to control everything. Well, that's and, it. And that's really, yeah. And that's what he's trying to do. You know, I, I say in my book, I'm reading, I say, we're told in various places that the Lord searches the hearts and the minds to give man his, his deeds, his rightful deeds. The Antichrist can't do that. But with the technologies that are being made today, he can track everybody's footsteps. He can control how they act, how they spend. How he can shut them off if right. they're involved in his, his system. It'll be very easy to shut shut them off. You hit the button and that guy's yeah. out. And, you, and also the Antichrist is going to appear um, omnipresent and uh, omniscient. Like he knows everything because everything about us is going to be tracked. We're already tracked. Uh, Apple came out with, released a, a study yesterday it said uh, people aren't obeying the, the shelter at home anymore because they're able to track everybody on their phones and their watches mm -hmm. and realize people are going about their business again. They're kind of done with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're already being tracked, but this is going to be a system of all systems. It'll be extremely crushing. Uh, and the amazing thing is so many people are going to be willing to just submit to that system that's coming. Right. Well, they're there's a segue that leads up to it. We're told in early on in Revelation 13 that the Antichrist actually resurrects, and it appears to be a, a genuine resurrection, mm -hmm. but we, that's a whole other topic. Yeah. But it says at that point the world marvels and starts to follow him. Yeah. So by the time the false prophet comes on to the scene at the midpoint of the tribulation, there's already a huge following for the Antichrist. And when he says, let's make an image, and you must worship him or be, worship the image of the beast or be killed, then he comes out with the mark of the beast. So most everybody at that time is going to say, you know, here's my right hand, here's my forehead. There will be some people who need a little more coaxing going on. So in other words, we'll kill you if you don't do it, yeah. right? It's an authoritarian, authoritarian, you said it better than I just did. Uh, uh, authoritarian, authoritarian dictator is what it is, yeah. right? So, but the thing is really interesting about it, I've got actually three chapters on the mark of the beast, my new book, introducing it, the casualist economy, and what are the spiritual implications of it. When you take the mark of the beast, you're now appointed to the wrath of God and you will be cast into the lake of fire. There's no forgiveness, mercy, or grace, which is at the, where God's heart is. Why is that? Mm -hmm. What is that point of no return that happens when someone takes that mark of the beast? Because you would say to yourself, well, because some people are saying, that with, like Billy Crone is an advocate of this right now. He's talking about there's DNA alterations going on. Mm -hmm. One uh, epigenetic person told him in an interview, if you change your body just 1% and you're no longer a man, you're no longer made in the image of God, this sort of thing. What, what is it that happens to man at that point when they take this mark that they can no longer be saved, that they can't do a U-turn for Christ, if you will? Um, is, uh, is it because God said, enough already, uh, you, I don't want you worshiping other gods? Well, he's tolerated that. You know, 
uh, 1.6 billion Muslims bowing down five times a day. You know, there's all kinds of people worshiping different gods. And gods. any of them can get saved. Right. And the other thing, too, is they're saying that some of this thing will likely have ability to help with healing, like the vaccine thing, uh, help people see better. Some of the DNA, uh, the, uh, DNA alterations are working on. Healing, powers, seeing better, et cetera, curing blindness. So is God going to fault someone for wanting to see better or be healed better? You know, that sort of thing. Or is he going to fault someone to want to buy milk for his family? No, there's something else going on with this mark of the beast that has a spiritual intonation on it. So I'm trying to bring this out in all the things. It's cashless, but more than that, why, do, is, why does it uh, put your destiny forward where you're going to? It's a one way passport into the lake of fire. Okay. So I have a question here about the, the Antichrist and false prophet I want to get to in a minute. But one of the real pushes for a cashless society right now is because uh, they're saying, look, you can't pass on these viruses with, if you go to cashless. If you have cash, you, you, they're contaminated. Um, and, and personally, um, I think a lot of these things are being used as an excuse to be able to bring about this plan that is intended. I've, I've read it, uh, parts, the parts of Agenda 2030 that affect this. Mm -hmm. And so I know what's coming, so it appears to me this is a tool that's being used. So I have troubled, I'm, I'm troubled by these things as I read them. Mm -hmm. um, with the Antichrist and the False Prophet, here's this question. Um, there's a lot of talk about Bill Gates, uh, uh, and this is specifically for you, Bill Gates uh, and Emmanuel Macron <laughs> from France, we know, um, being very anti-Christ-esque, and Pope Francis being the number one candidate for the false prophet. What's your opinion? I'll give my opinion, too, if you want, but, you know, if you want to, that's, that's definitely speculation. Right. Well, um, let's, first of all, whoever he's going to be, he's going to come out of the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary. He's going to be of Roman Empire descent, right, of European dis descent. I'm not going to pin the tail on the Antichrist because we're not going to know who he is. He's not going to be revealed until after the church is gone. Is he alive today? I think he probably is. You know, Satan's always had to have a candidate, candidate on the shelf because he didn't know when the rapture was going to happen, just like we don't know. And at that point, that Antichrist was going to come out as a white horseman in the first seal judgment, Revelation chapter 6. Um, I don't personally think, the, from the false prophet perspective, uh, I don't think the Pope's a false prophet. And I actually have a chapter in my book called um, The False Prophet, the upcoming book coming out. And I ask that question, is the Pope the false prophet? And I list various reasons why I don't believe so. So uh, the book is going to be called either The End Prophecies or Final Prophecies. I haven't determined the title yet. They're going to want to read that chapter. So I am going to want to read that chapter because there are a lot of people that are sure thinking I've written an article. On it. I've written an article on it, by the way. Is the Pope the false prophet? They can go and read it on... Google, here, just Google it. Well, here, here's a problem. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I remember reading several years ago, I don't know, 15 years ago, uh, there's an individual out of Spain that everybody, so many people are saying he's the Antichrist. Prophecy teachers labeled him as Antichrist, and then he died. And he's been dead for, I think, 12 years now. And uh, I, I wish I could remember what his name was. Javier Solana. Do you remember Javier Solana? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I remember that. But people rumor. are saying yeah. that. Yeah. And, and so you hear these things. And... and you know, just for people who have those questions, you got to be really careful on labeling. Uh, because you go out there and you label, then they're dead. Listen, the, when the Antichrist comes, it's going to be he, and it, this person will be a he, because it's always masculine in the Bible, mm -hmm. the Antichrist is, will be extremely charismatic. False prophet, I'm interested to hear what you have to say on that. Uh, the Pope does do some strange things. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 13, the false prophet's going to have two horns that look like a lamb, so he's going to appear very Christian. Yet he's going to speak like a dragon. He's going to say things that are of the devil. Mm -hmm. And I've heard some Catholic people comment. He, he, he claims to be this big Christian supporter, but they say, man, he speaks some really evil stuff. Right. And that's coming from some of my Catholic friends. Let's move on. Another, this is another one from Brit Gillette. We don't, we don't have a lot of time left, but we're going, I'm going to go a couple minutes over. I can't ask everybody out there if that's okay, because I really have some more. I want to get to Israel, ask some questions about Israel and, uh, but this is the last one from Britt Gillette. He says there almost also needs to be a decreased demand for oil. And uh, what, what do you say about that? We're watching it. We're watching what's happening with oil. Right. Well, I, again, why, why is he saying these things in connection with the end times? Well, he's probably relating to the coming invasion of Russia with Turkey and Iran and a coalition of nine in Ezekiel 38 into Israel for plunder and booty, and that we would 
tend to think that that's got something to do with natural gas, you know, natural resources, energy supplies, and so, which Israel's getting right now. I mean, yeah. they've got the natural gas they've developed, the Tamar One, the Leviathan, the oil, et cetera. So I, I think that's where he's going with that. Now, oil right now is $19 per barrel. I mean, it's way down. At one point, it was down to like, you know, eight bucks or nine bucks a barrel. It's going to affect Russia because they need it, I think, to be, I don't know the amount, I think it's like $40 minimum or something. When it, could, when it started dropping, Venezuela went through the tank because they needed it to be like $135 a barrel or something like yeah. that. So. so, yeah, well, you look at it now with the way oil is gone, Russia is being devastated. Saudi Arabia is even being devastated. I've been reading things, mm -hmm. and you look at this and you go, two players, I think we can get to, we'll have, I'll make sure we have enough time to get a little bit more into Ezekiel 38 mm -hmm. at the end. But you look at this and you're going, are these things just a coincidence that all these things are happening right now? At the same time, yeah, they're converging. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing, the global setup, mm -hmm. um, a talk about this global identification and it's going to make the world live in heart. I mean, you look at it's everything is just one after another. Okay, here's here we go. Uh, Netanyahu, let's focus on Israel. Netanyahu and Gantz over in Israel. Prime Minister Netanyahu and Gantz they agreed to form a new national emergency unity government. On July 1st, uh, there's a plan to initially uh, initiate uh, the legislation to be able to annex several areas in the West Bank, including areas of Judea and Samaria. Um, where do you see this going? Well, I Especially being a Psalm 83, <laughs> you're the guy who, who really put the Psalm 83 uh, theory out there. Right. And uh, it's caused a lot of people love it and a lot of people don't. I got a question that just came in about it. But apart from Psalm 83 uh, war, where do you see this going with Gantz and Netanyahu and they're wanting to annex the West Bank. Well, um, if they were able to maintain their alliance, their allegiance together, because the high courts are now going to question that over the next few days as to whether, because they're sort of rewriting their, their laws and stuff by doing what they're doing. So the next few days will be interesting to see if they prevail. Otherwise, they'll probably get cast into a fourth, another election. But I think it's going to prevail, and I do think they're going to move forward to annex the those portions in the West Bank, which are biblical heartlands of Judea and Samaria. Now, I think that's going to go over like a lead balloon with the Arab community. The Palestinians yeah. are going to really hate it. Of course we know that. They're already having emergency meetings with the Arab League to talk about you know, preventing this sort of thing. So, But I think it leads to the wars. I think there's biblical wars that there's Psalm 83, but there's also peripheral things that happen inside of that, the destruction of Damascus, the toppling of Jordan, the terrorization of Egypt, etc. that I think is going to be provoked by this type of thing. Yeah. I, so I, I look at this. If we have enough time, I'll let, I'll let you uh, tell everybody about Psalm 83 thoughts there, too. When I look at this, here's something interesting about this plan expand of expanding Israel's borders. Uh, the problem, Israel and the United States, this is Damon Duck, uh, are proposing a map, and I think you've seen this, I've seen this, this map that will divide Israel and set aside perhaps as much as two-thirds of Judea and Samaria for a Palestinian state. So it'll divide it. it and I look at uh, Daniel chapter 11 and the warning uh, about the one who's going to come and divide the land. I look at also uh, Joel chapter 3. God says, I will judge any nation that divides my land. And then, of course, he says what you said. The Palestinians are never going to go for it anyways unless the Jews are completely removed from the land and don't have any of Israel. But you look at this and you go, uh, we certainly live in some interesting, interesting times. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go out on a limb and go on the record. It ain't going to be divided. If we're as far down the timeline as we think, you know, Trump's peace plan has got a lot of problems with it. The only good thing is it's promoting the annexation of the biblical heartlands, parts of it. Um, it also calls for Jerusalem to be the capital of the Palestinian state, dividing up parts of Israel, et cetera. Um, we don't want to do that. That's what, like you said, that's, God faults us for doing those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, judges the nations for doing that sort of thing. You know, they, they yeah. tried to do it in 1948, they had the war in 1949, and then they had the Green Line, which divided up through Jerusalem, and then that only lasted a few years until 1967, Israel got it back. You know, you cannot divide that land for any period of time. Matter of fact, Israel is going to grow in that area. Jeremiah 49 and Zephaniah 2 talks about Israel taking over Jordan. 
Uh, five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan, Isaiah 19, 18. Israel is going to move into the Gaza, Obadiah 1, verses 19 and 20, up into parts of southern Lebanon, Zarephath, Obadiah 19, 1. I mean, Israel is going to be moving out as a result of things that I think are about to happen real soon. So, okay, I was going to ask you a time frame then, as in the other question, when it, you think these things, we're, we're watching, everything's been fast forwarded. We can expect the is, Israel to increase. This is what I do expect to happen with Israel. Um, we know from reading the Bible that God blesses Israel. And they're only going to become more and more of a desirable nation for the world to want what, have, what Israel has. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the same time, the United States is not going to, we, I, I know this is bothersome to a lot of people, but the United States is going to diminish and it's not going to be the superpower mm -hmm. that it has been. That's mm -hmm. very hard for Americans to hear, mm -hmm. but we could be watching these things shift right now. But I do know this, Israel's going gonna, Israel's gonna to come out of this looking really strong. Well, they're going to come out, they're going to end this Arab-Israeli conflict militarily. It's not going to be diplomatically uh, pr uh, produced. And there's all kinds of biblical prophecies that talk about the Israeli defense forces warring and winning and expanding the nation of Israel into territories. That's not, that have not found fulfillment yet. Good. That happened apart from Ezekiel 38. You know, and so when we get to Ezekiel 38, that what is Israel going to look like at that point in yeah. time? How wealthy are they really going to be? So in Isaiah chapter 17, for example, we have the battle there where Israel uh, it appears that Israel takes out Damascus in the period of one night. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's these battles that are coming. Everything is moving very fast. I have this other question that came. I have so many questions. We are not going to be able to get to them all. This says, when uh, in the timeline will all Israel be saved? That would be a quote from Romans chapter 11. Uh, when will all Israel be saved? Well, you said it. I should define what all Israel being saved means also. Well, all Israel means all Israel that exists when they get saved. In other words, let me, let me say that, not to make that like a play on words. You said in Matthew 23, Jesus said, uh, you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We find out in Hosea 5.15 that a Jewish remnant will do that in their affliction. He says in Hosea 5.15, I return to my place, the Messiah, Jesus has gone back to heaven, until in their affliction they recognize their offense, which is generational rejection of Jesus Christ. In their affliction they will plead for me to return, and he'll return, I'm paraphrasing. So in the tribulation period, at the end when the remnant flees, after the midpoint of the tribulation when the Antichrist begins his genocidal campaign, which will be worse than Hitler's, of the Jewish people, there will be a remnant, a third of the Jews, it says in Zechariah 13, 9, will come through that fire, and they'll flee. And that becomes all that's left of Israel because we're told that two-thirds of them get cut off in the land, according to Zechariah 13.8, by the Antichrist. So what happens is that's all that's left of Israel, and that Israel, that remnant called the faithful remnant, will peck in Jesus' return. They will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, mm -hmm. and it'll happen in that end of that tribulation period, mm -hmm. and that's, that provokes us, promotes the second coming. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this. With a, you quoted Hosea, and a lot of people don't even read the, the prophet Hosea, and a lot of the prophet Hosea has to do with the last days when Israel returns to the land. Right. It's a fascinating read when you read it in the context, knowing Hosea was the prophet who was told to marry the unfaithful woman. He had to buy her back uh, from the slave trading, the sex slave trading auction, and all that, and you find out this is about God redeeming Israel in the That's final right. days. That's right. When all Israel will be saved. Okay, I have a couple of other questions. I really do want to get to Psalm 83, and we're, we're kind of out of time, but I'm hoping our audience will be good and we go a little bit over. So this is uh, on April 21. It was reported that YouTube CEO uh, Susan Wojcicki, I'm not sure if I pronounced her name right, admitted that YouTube has removed thousands of videos because they contradict World Health Organization recommendations. We're on YouTube right now, so see what happens here. <laughs> so the director general of the WHO, World Health Organization, is a communist from Ethiopia, he, this author writes. His main support comes from China. President Trump has suspended U.S. contributions to the WHO for parroting China's lies and mishandling the coronavirus crisis. The U.S. states of Missouri and Mississippi are suing China for lying, and YouTube is censoring those that contradict what 
uh, the who says truth and freedom are not being tolerated in the coming world government mm-hmm. and you look at this and we're, we're hearing more and more about things being censored on YouTube mm-hmm. and it's there's a narrative mm-hmm. that's going forward is what it appears to me so that's why these things are being censored is mm-hmm. that what you see are you hearing Similar yeah, I think you're going to see that with all the big monopolies. Uh, you know, you're going to see with the social medias, they control everything, YouTube, et cetera. They're going, to, they're going to go onto that global mindset, and they're going to censor everything that doesn't fit in the nature of that global mindset. Yeah. I think there's, they've demonetized a lot of spiritual you know, teachers' channels that, you know, that used to make quite a bit of money from YouTube, you know, being, getting a lot of views and advertising. They've demonetized a lot of that. So it's just going to get worse in my estimation. Uh, here, here's this article. It, 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 I think it sums up a lot of things. Um, and this wasn't based on Bible at all. This is just a secular article. This is Reuters. End of U.S. global dominance predicted in wake of COVID-19 as world order to reinvent itself. And I would say that's secular. That's, that's Reuters. And that's, as a Bible prophecy guy, that's what I see is developing. Mm-hmm. And that's what has some people like us concerned. And we're supposed to sound a warning. We're supposed to be watchmen. Uh, some people want to hear, some people don't. But we still need to let people know this is what's going on. Jesus is coming. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's what we're doing. Bill, I want, to, I want to give you an opportunity to say something about Psalm 83. Because I know you catch a lot of heat for it. Uh, some people love your idea on Psalm 83. Some people do not. Um, real briefly, um, can you give our viewers a rundown on um, the way you see Psalm 83? Some say it's a prayer, and only a prayer you say it's a prophecy that is still to be fulfilled. Correct. Yeah, uh, Asaph, who wrote it 3,000 years ago, was a prophet. We're told that in Second Chronicles 29:30, He wrote 13 psalms, Psalm 50 and Psalm 83 especially, are his most prophetic psalms. And he talked about a time where a, a group of confederating nations, which happened to be those ones who came against Israel in 1948, are going to come together with their terrorist populations they got now to wipe the nation of Israel off the map. The, the name will be remembered no more. Tells us who they're going to be. Mm-hmm. Petitions how he wants God to respond to it by taking our attention back to the book of Judges with Gideon and the Midianites and the Canaanites from the time of Deborah. And the long and short story of it is, is that that has not found final fulfillment, and yet those when, when we find out how Asaph petitioned the Lord to deal with it, we find that in all those cases that he went back to, the, the end of the conflict, it ended the oppression, that Israel could dwell securely and that sort of thing. That has not happened yet. Some people think it happened in 1948, but those same countries came back in 67. They came back in 73. And they're still alive and well right now, and they still don't recognize Israel's right to exist for the most part. They got some fragile t- peace treaties with Jordan and with Egypt. But I'll, if you get my Psalm 83 book, you're going to see that those treaties are going to go away in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah 19, verses 1 through 18, Zephaniah 2, verses 8 through 9. That, those treaties are not going to be existing for much longer. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. That's very good. Listen, I got people online want us to go over a couple more minutes. So you got a couple more minutes with me? Well, yeah. I mean, normally when I teach here on your Sunday nights, I'm, you know, we're looking at the clock because these people got kids in the yeah. Sunday school. Well, we don't have all. kids in Sunday so school. We got, so I, get, I, want, I, I want to take a couple more questions. There's some really good ones that came in. And I also want to remind everybody out there, make sure that you subscribe to this YouTube channel. It's absolutely free. And also to follow on, on my Facebook to get the updates and know you can watch. You have to like uh, my Facebook channel. Um, but with that, and, and share this with everybody. Um, Bill, Bill's friends, my friends, people we don't even know. Listen, this is great. So I look at this. This came in, and thank you for sharing that on Psalm 83 also. Uh, you have a lot of books out. I have a couple of books out. I have this one, America in the New World Order. Uh, it's sold out, great so we book. went to our th- third printing. Awesome. Um, I think you actually wrote some things. I love that me. book. It's a yeah. great book, yeah. And, then, uh, and, and what's so fascinating, like your books, when you base your books on the Bible, you can write them. This that was four years ago. Mm-hmm. You remember Pastor Lane? He was just That's before, right, yeah. just before he went home to be with heaven. It was four years ago, and things that because of the Bible, you can say this is what's going to come, and you read, go, wow, this is actually coming. It's if because we know what the Bible says. That's right. One of the things I really liked about your book, the, the meticulous time you did to put all those quotes of the old presidents and things, and showed how they 
where we're not where we were as we've gone through time. Really well done on that. And it's a short book. It's really a good. It's a short book. I want to make it easy for someone like me to read. <laughs> but you have a lot of books out there, and we can find both of our ours on uh, on uh, Amazon, on your website also. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a couple more questions, real quick. How can somebody get a hold of you? Prophecy, Prophecy Depot. Depot, like Home Depot, prophecydepot.com. Prophecy Depot, or just Google your name, and they'll take them to Prophecy Depot too. Yes, yeah, yeah, S A L U S. S A L U S. And I and I don't care what people say about me as long as they spell my name right. <laughs> people, people are mean. It's amazing how mean people are on the <laughs> internet. Anyways, so here's here's this article, Bill, UN chief. Again, this is th th this isn't Bible stuff, but it's so fascinating. The UN chief insists coronavirus recovery must address greenhouse gases. This is what I was talking about <laughs> in this book. And, and I've been saying that when we get through this coronavirus, you're going to see climate laws are going to come out of this mm -hmm. from Agenda 2030. They're going to be enforced. Mm -hmm. And we're watching this going, how can you, we don't know the day or hour, but we do know what to watch for. Mm -hmm. And things are coming fast. There are some, obviously, things still need to be developed. Uh, we know that. That's what you're talking about. Um, uh, but they're going to all connect about the same time from a different angle. And I we're mean, starting they're to all watch working them all from different angles right. coming, coming mm -hmm. together. Um, here's this question. I heard an interview, um, and this well-known pastor seemed to believe that the mark of the beast was a forgivable sin. Like well, you can be forgiven. I, 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 I don't know who said that, and I don't, I, I don't think that uh, fits in any scriptures I've read because you, you are appointed to the wrath of God when that happens. They will receive loathsome sores with the first bowl judgment yeah. as their first hand slept. They will be cast into the lake of fire, we're told in Revelation 20, along with their friends, the false prophet and the Antichrist. So um, I don't see, it's not a forgivable sin. I, I don't see that in scripture. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't either. In fact, there's an angel, Revelation chapter 14, that warns the entire right. world, do not receive the mark of the beast, or, and then your doom, it, the angel describes your doom. Right. And there's, there's no turning back. That's so right. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't see it as being forgivable. Here, here's another question. Um, I want to deal with this question in more detail next time. Okay. But what about the temple being built? Uh, when is that time frame? So with that, let me set it up, and then you can talk about it. Second Thessalonians, we can tell from Second Thessalonians chapter 2 mm -hmm. that there will be a temple built um, mm -hmm. because the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple and demand to be worshipped as God. We know the sacrifices start from Daniel chapter 9. Uh, and, and so we can look at various passages and put together Revelation chapter, I believe it's chapter 11. We can also realize, okay, there is going to be a temple that's going to mm -hmm. be built because in Revelation chapter 11, the outer court is given over to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, this question is just, when do you see that? I think what they're asking is, could that be built before the rapture? Is Like Ezekiel chapter 38 war. Could that be something we could see before the rapture? Do we know? Do we know it's in the last days? What do you think? Well, it's hard to say what's going to happen before the rapture because nothing has to happen before the rapture. It's an imminent event. Could it happen before the tribulation, I think, is a more sound question. I think Ezekiel 38 probably will for various reasons. Um, when it comes to the temple, I think actually part of the false covenant, some of the true content of the false covenant is worded in such a way that the Jews can actually build their temple. And there's three different biblical clues I put forward in the next prophecies book as to why I believe that's the case. So I believe personally that they, the Jews start building that temple right at the beginning of the tribulation if it's not already been built, I think it starts right then. And that's why we see John in Revelation 11, 1 through 3, with a measuring rod, measuring the temple, but not the outer court because it's given over to the Gentiles. Which, by the way, that's the first time in Jewish temple history that they would have to negotiate with Gentiles. And I believe those are the harlot Gentiles who have claims in through Jerusalem. It says they'll trod through Jerusalem for three and a half years to be able to get through their, you know, and I believe that's personally the Catholic Church. I believe the Catholic Church is the harlot world religion who has got great control over areas yeah. and sites over there so um if the catholic the pope's not the false prophet you have the harlot world religion you put those in different categories no i put or, the, i put the pope as the leader of the harlot world religion and the, the, remember the harlot okay. world religions get desolated by the ten kings mm -hmm. at the midpoint of the right. tribulation 
So the Pope at that time is either killed, imprisoned, or sent to exile. It's not likely that he's going to be turned around going, hey, you know, that was a good idea. You took us out. I think we're going to vote everybody to start worshiping you now, the Antichrist, right? That's one of the various reasons I put. I've got about a dozen reasons why I don't believe the Pope is a false yeah. prophet. Um, I have one more question for you, I think. <laughs> one more question. Oh, the, okay. There are some pastors that believe the rapture is an invention from the 18th century. What say you? Well, I think Paul would have a trouble with that. <laughs> I would say that 53 too. AD, he spoke to the Thessalonians, yeah. and 56 AD, he spoke to the, wrote to the Corinthians. Yeah. First Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 18, clearly tell him. Jesus talked about coming to get us for his mansions in heaven in John 14, 1 through 6. Yeah. Um, I think these guys were talking about the rapture. Yeah. Well, okay, with, with Paul, where he's writing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I, I don't see how anybody can argue that there's a rapture, because w whatever time frame you put it in, because uh, the term there that Paul uses is uh, those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That word in the Greek is harpazo, mm -hmm. Latin is rap rapir, rapturo, rapturo right. and, and that's where we get our English word rapture that's from. Right, so yeah. it's clearly a teaching that's in the Bible. What troubles people is, um, and these are usually... Bible scholars that disagree with the rapture, which is remarkable. You know, they should know. Uh, what I think what bothers them is this never happened before, so they can't make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole lot of things that can't, could be make, made sense of. Noah, before the flood, what's a flood? Mm -hmm. You know, people would have had no concept of, of that. Right. The miracles that Jesus does that don't make any sense. Um, some people even in, that run through Christian churches teaching Teach, well, Jesus didn't really even do those miracles. So if people can't make sense of it, they, they think, well, mm -hmm. that's not really what it teaches. But the Bible clearly teaches a rapture of a generation of people will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, then the wrath of God comes, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, that's right. So the, And we're not appointed to the wrath. We're delivered from we're the wrath. Appointed to Christ wrath. saves us from the wrath. We're kept from the hour of trial. Um, and we're to encourage one another with these words. So w the way I look at it right now is if someone wants to know if there's a rapture, they need to become a believer. So let's start going in that direction. Become a believer, and you'll know that there's a rapture. And we'll just explain it to you about the timing of it and how it works on the way up. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That is great. Bill, thank you very much. There's a lot more questions we have. I want to have you back. I want to talk about the temple. I want to talk about the covenant of Daniel chapter 9. We can talk about the rapture. We can talk about a lot of these questions we didn't get to uh, tonight. But uh, any final words for anybody? Well, I think as we come down to the point of are we, is the coronavirus signaling that we are at the end now of this, over a century now of this birth pains period, this beginning of sorrows period, that means the tribulation is racing towards us. That means the rapture is all the, the more prevalent, prevalent in front of us because we're not appointed to the wrath and the tribulation. Amen. So it's no time to be playing church anymore. I know a lot of you can't get into church, but some of you were going to church and just playing church. You can accept the Lord right now in your front room. You can accept the Lord right now with this TV show. And I, don't, I would not encourage you to put it off because I do believe we're at the end of the beginning of sorrows. And the tribulation period is about to grab everybody. And it won't let go. Amen. In fact, to accept the Lord, this is what you need to do. You need to ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. Recognize your sinner and repent. To repent is to make a conscious decision, to turn from your sin, and surrender to Christ. It's to make a U-turn. And we look at all of these things. These are signs that, uh, that Jesus is coming again. They're, they're a warning signs that we need to be ready. Jesus said, watch and be ready. And, and if you want to make sure that you're ready, and you're prayed up, and you've asked Christ to forgive you, and you've repented, uh, then pray this with me. Pray right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner. And ask that you'll forgive me of my sin. I repent of my sin in unbelief, and I surrender to you as Lord. I thank you for forgiving me. I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, if you if just ask Christ to forgive you, you can like that comment right there uh, that you see on Facebook or wherever it is you're watching this, and we will follow up with you. We want to make sure we get your Bible and uh, whatever else is needed. We'll answer your questions for you. With that, be sure that you subscribe and share this with as many friends as possible. Bill, it was fantastic having you here with me tonight. Thank you so much, and God bless you, everybody. Thanks, Tom.